earned for every dollar spent on the program. And lastly, employees may be eligible for new apprenticeship tax credits for education. Here on this slide, I would like to share the following resources, tools, and websites to help you with your apprenticeship program in Illinois. We have a quick toolkit starter kit for apprenticeship programs. We have a federal resource playbook for registered and apprenticeship program. And we also have a DLL registration site. We have also on this slide, we have the apprenticeshipillinois.com and apprenticeship.org. Now let's welcome our next presenter, Mr. Greg Schmidt is currently the Director of Talent Development at the Calumet Industrial Commission, which serves as the apprenticeship intermediary for Region 4 in Illinois. He supports apprenticeship expansion grants from the Department of Labor, as well as from the Department of Economic Development for Illinois. He is also the Chairman of the Board for the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Go ahead, Greg, take it away. Hi, good morning, and uh, everyone, Nora, thank you, and uh, thank uh, St. Augustine College for co coordinating this presentation and inviting us to join, especially as we celebrate Apprenticeship Week. I um, want to start out with a little bit about the Calumet Area Industrial Commission. Um, David, are you sharing my slides? Hmm. Are we, Lenore, do we know, David, are you sharing the slides? I don't see them. Oh, there we go. All right, next slide. All right, so Calumetary Industrial Commission. We've been in existence since 1967. We're a non-for-profit membership-based organization located in the southern tip of the city of Chicago, um, right in the hub of the manufacturing industry from metropolitan Chicago to, to Northwest Indiana. Over the years, we've expanded to include many of the South suburbs and even moved into Will County, all which has a huge manufacturing base. Um, we're an industrial advocacy, economic development, business development, workforce development, and community outreach organization, mainly focused on the manufacturing sector. Um, next slide, thank you. A little more about us. We provide a number of community resources that are funded under the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership which is funded under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, known as WIOA. You know, so we provide from job readiness training to on-the-job training to job placement um, for individuals who are unemployed or underemployed, and really is to help them find a, a sustaining wage and, and career. Next slide, please. Uh, we offer a number of resources for businesses, from business development incentives to training reimbursement and apprenticeship programs of what I'm going to talk about today. And certainly a huge value is the networking events and educational workshops that uh, that we hold for our, our members. Um, so there's two programs I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, one is our role as an intermediary, um, C Calumet Area Industrial Commission, known as CAIC, was awarded an apprenticeship expansion grant through the Department of Community and Economic Opportunity, Department of Labor. Um, we're an intermediary as defined by DCO. And, and so what that means is that we are here to provide the linkages between businesses, educational institution, and the Department of Labor to help get an apprenticeship program started or even to help reignite one, right? Um, and as you've heard, there are various types of apprenticeships and we can help walk you through that process. As an intermediary, we promote apprenticeships along with navigators such as St. Augustine College. Um, we can help you be a sponsor. We can help manage your program and we'll support uh, the apprenticeships, apprenticeships along the way. So we really play that, that consultant role. Um, and what does that mean? That means that the grant pays the education or the tuition for one in a registered apprenticeship program meaning that for the first year of the education for an apprentice, CAIC will pick up that cost, whether it's tuition at a community college or another training provider, or if you have your own trainer or you bring in someone to do the training, we will offset that cost. These could be you know, new employees or, or current employees. Some companies use apprenticeships as an onboarding tool, uh, meaning that they start out as an apprentice from, from day one, and then others focus on incumbent workers or their current workforce and training them to move up into specific jobs. And also assist in, in workers in getting that journeyman card and assist companies in their retention efforts. Go, go back, please. Um, the period, is, it's now, 
you know, so um, now through next year, so, so you don't want to wait. Now, as I said, the funding will pay for the first year. And then it's really anticipated that the company will, you know, then continue the program. And so this is really just a, you know, to, to get us started, it reignited and um, help, uh, you know, help uh, the companies implement apprenticeship programs. Uh, next slide, please. And then one last thing, just with the, um, what the uh, Calumet Area Industrial Commission in terms of what we, uh, programs that we have is, is funded through the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Um, the program is to help unemployed and dislocated workers train for new careers and help employers with the cost of that training. And so, um, and this is where the, the grant that we have will reimburse um, an employer 50% of the first six months of wages for a new employee. You know, as you can, you know, so if you're hiring new individuals, there's grant monies that will offset that those wages. And those can be, you know, quite a, a substantial amount. You know, as you can see, there's a, some criteria that it must be at a permanent employee, not, not, a, not a temporary worker, must pay at least $14 an hour. They've worked in Illinois previously. And then also the Calumetary Industrial Commission, we can help you find the, the, those workers. We, we do have... Uh, uh, individuals who are targeted at uh, recruitment. And so we can uh, help funnel employees into your location. So, you know, as you can see, lots of great programs. Uh, it would highly well, you know, welcome conversation about these. And um, um, just let me know if you're available uh, through the chat. And um, otherwise, I'm going to turn this back over to Lenore. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. Now I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Mrs. Michelle Mills Ajeha. Michelle is the Education and Youth Lead for the Office of Apprenticeship for the U.S. Department of Labor. She will also address the characteristics and benefits of a registered apprenticeship and youth apprenticeship program. I had the opportunity to be present for a presentation by Michelle earlier this year, and we were so fortunate to have her with us today to share her expertise. Take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Lenora, and thank you all. I'm so excited and thrilled to be here uh, this morning to talk about apprenticeship programs. Um, you know, it's it's interesting how I got to the Office of Apprenticeship. Um, so I am in the Office of Apprenticeships Division of Workforce Operation and Investment, and I lead our education and youth portfolios, uh, mainly focusing on uh, developing strategic partnerships at the secondary and post-secondary educational levels, uh, supporting investments that promote college-sponsored apprenticeships, youth-focused apprenticeships, uh, you know, brokering new relationships across federal agencies uh, that promote place-based initiatives to get people into apprenticeship programs. So I'm just very delighted to be here with you all on a Friday to talk about apprenticeship because truly, it is a proven workforce solution. Apprenticeship has been around since 1911, thereabout. Um, started off in Wisconsin. Then 1937, we have the National Apprenticeship Act. And we've just really evolved since then in terms of the plethora of industries that we're, we're crossing, the diversification in program design and participants reaching new sectors and even geographic distribution across rural, urban, et cetera. So I'm just so excited because apprenticeship as a model has truly delivered on all fronts. So today I'm gonna to be talking about it. Uh, I'll kind of explain some of the key elements of an apprenticeship. Um, it was mentioned, talk a little bit about how you can register an apprenticeship program. So I'm excited to do that. Here are the five components of a registered apprenticeship um, and also IRAP, which is another model that we have, but my understanding today we're talking about registered. Uh, it's a job from day one, um, which is key and important under 29 CFR 29. Um, apprentices get paid, it's employment. They get on the job learning or what we call OJL or OJT. And this is usually 2000 hours at a minimum. There's also RTI related technical instruction, which is at a, uh, recommended at about 144 hours. They also learn with a mentor or back in the day, we would say journey worker, because especially that term came up a lot in the construction industry. And of course there's an industry recognized portable credential that, a, that an apprentice receives at the end of that apprenticeship. This really tells the industry that this individual is 
proficient in that specific occupation. And when I say the occupation right now to date, we have about over 1300 apprenticeable occupations. Can you imagine that? And what that means is that we have consulted with industry. We figured out all the guidelines in terms of the work processes, the amount of time, the specific related technical instruction that would be required for a specific apprentice to be proficient in that occupation or field. So, you know, it's an exciting time for apprenticeship. We're growing rapid growth. We're diversifying um, in terms of the industries that we're touching. So I'm excited to kind of walk through and talk about this. One key aspect I want you all to take away here today, if you could just jot this down on a piece of paper, 29 CFR 29, specifically 29.5. This is where you're going to find all the key elements of a registered apprenticeship program, right? It's been simplified here on the slide, highlighting the five, five hallmarks of apprenticeship. Um, you know, so that's what you really want to look at in terms of a guide, guideline or guidance to, you know, walk through and figure out what are the key components of an apprenticeship program. In the next slide, we're going to just highlight some of the benefits of registered apprenticeship. And Lenora did an excellent job talking about the benefits for employers, career seekers, um, and as well as educators, right? And so this kind of compiles some of the key highlights. For an apprentice, over their lifetime, they earn $300,000 more than if they did not enter into an apprenticeship program. Wow, major, right? This is just one of the keys key components that really attract someone to an apprenticeship program. We also know um, from our last year data, fiscal year data, an apprentice completer would earn $70,000, whereas someone with a degree would earn 64 k So there's a slight advantage there. Now, you know, one key aspect is that we've seen from 1911 up till now, the game of apprenticeship has really changed in terms of how we're partnering with education, right? It's no longer competition, it's more complementary and supplemental. Again, if you go back to that previous slide, again, RTI related technical instruction is key component of an apprenticeship program. Um, let's go back real quick. For every dollar that you invest, you have a dollar 47. Um, that was on that slide. And there's also a 94% retention rate, meaning that these apprentices are hired after the life of their apprenticeship program. And so that is key. I want to emphasize these benefits because it's really, really what you're going to sell in terms of to your um, at the academic institutions, to the employers, the industry groups. They want to know what's the ROI right? And we have it here for you. Even some states have become innovative to develop ROI calculators uh, where you can go on their website and see, okay, I want to pick an occupation, maybe pharmacy tech, um, apprenticeship. What is the, uh, the uh, salary that I will get after completing this apprenticeship program, right? So we're becoming more innovative across multiple states in terms of uh, delivering on here's the value, benefit, and impact of an apprenticeship. Next slide, please. So just want to highlight some of the industries here. As I mentioned, we have grown since 1911. It's no longer just the brick and mortar. We're in um, construction still, of course, and that is where you will see kind of like the high uptick because that's kind of the bedrock of apprenticeship. But now we're in biotech, we're in engineering, we're in IT, we're in finance, services. We're in telecommunications, right? So we have really expanded the field of apprenticeship opportunities um, since 1911, right? And what was really key and critical was an executive order passed by the president in 2017 on expanding apprenticeships in America. And section six talked about partnerships with colleges. It talks about specific key industries, healthcare, advanced manufacturing, IT. It talked about really becoming innovative in the apprenticeship space. And so we took that, we ran with that across federal government. You'll see the Department of Education, um, you know, other departments supporting apprenticeship programming and rolling out investments to do that because we're really stretching and moving beyond what has been traditionally done to introduce new in industries and introduce new players in the apprenticeship space. So next, 
as you can see, also we launch apprenticeship.gov because we're becoming innovative, right? So after 2017, we had that executive order. We started changing the game. We decided we want a one-stop shop for all things apprenticeship. So apprenticeship.gov connects career seekers, employers, educators, sponsors, intermediaries, everyone. We have a partner finder, just put in your zip code and you can find partners in your area. We have an apprenticeship finder for career seekers. You want a job and you want to know, is this really a job that's open? Apprenticeship.gov has a 97% precision rate, meaning we're not putting up stuff on there that is just not applicable, right? We're putting information there that we know is accurate, we're pulling from um, Monster, we're push, pulling from Indeed, we're pulling from all of these different job sites and it's verified, right? So we have a 97% uh, precision rate. We've seen an uptick um, in the past couple of months in terms of site visits, which is major, because that means that more players are entering into the apprenticeship space. And that is really key. It's a proven solution. And we're seeing all of our workforce development partners getting on apprenticeship and it's exciting. So we have a lot of tools, a lot of resources. Key that we have on there is what we call a standards builder, which we just rolled out uh, version two of that. So, you know, I talked about the elements of an apprenticeship program, the RTI, related technical instruction, the on-the-job learning component, right? How do you set that up? What's the work process for that, for the OGL? What's the RTI for that? In the standards builder, it helps you put together all of those pieces. So we have really took it to heart to cut down on the paperwork, cut down on the stringent processes, and we've streamlined things to make it really easy for intermediaries um, or navigators like Lenora to really work and use this uh, standards builder to help program sponsors, employers develop programs. So next you'll see here that we also have a special focus on young people on our website, right? So you've developed your program, how are you gonna get the young people involved, right? And I think even pre-pandemic, this was a concern. We, we see from the stats, young people weren't really involved. Summertime, you see a little bit of an uptick. Um, and so we're like, how can we really engage young people? So we have policy documents, a framework on high school apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship, which is an on-ramp to apprenticeship programs. Um, you know, we have guidance on WIOA, meaning how can registered apprenticeship be supported under WIOA for OJL, RTI, and supportive services. So we started putting these resources out there. Last year, we also got very innovative and creative and we partnered with Scholastic Magazine to issue um, you know, a, a magazine, a guidance for teachers, counselors, and parents to attract the middle school audience. Because we're recognizing high school might be a little bit too late. You know, obviously middle school folks aren't going to be apprentices, but we want to put the idea there. So the influencers, the parents, the guidance counselors, they understand the language of apprenticeship and the benefit of apprenticeship. Um, you know, interestingly, during this COVID time, we saw a major uptick in the downloads of Scholastic Magazine because, you know, parents are at home. They have to teach the kids, right? Um, so this goes into soft skills, different things, key ele elements of working on the job, not just in apprenticeship, but just in, in general, um, great work experience exposure. So we have excellent videos on here. We have toolkits, we have guides, we have fact sheets um, to kind of get the education community engaged in how can we connect with young people. We also have excellent partnership with the Vision of Youth Service in the Office of Workforce Investment. Love my colleagues there because they're really experts when it comes to WIOA and getting young people into these on-the-job learning opportunities, right? So we partnered with them. We put out a collaborative fact sheet on registered apprenticeship and WIOA for youth that's specific. And we are just continuing to partner with them in various ways in investments that I'll talk about a little bit later. So next, as you can see here, in this slide, we have a plethora of investments. We have been busy, right? Since 2015 up till now, um, we've received a lot of appropriated funding 
to support registered apprenticeship programs. And you'll see highlighted here, for instance, the Women in Apprenticeship in Non-Traditional Occupations, WANTO, that's out of the Women's Bureau. You'll see Closing the Skills Gap, that's out of Office of Workforce Investment. This just goes to show across the department ETA, we're supporting the apprenticeship programming because we know it's a great work-based learning program, right? So just wanna highlight some of these, we have intermediary contracts. Um, out there that we're supporting. We recently just announced a new set of intermediaries that is on apprenticeship.gov on our investments page. So all of these investments can be found there with the abstracts, with the partners, with the purpose, the objective, what is it focusing on? Are these folks in my local area? You can find all of that on apprenticeship.gov. What I just want to say is that we have about half a billion in active investments. This highlights, you know, um, most of our contracts and grants, but it's only growing. Um, and we have a small but mighty team in the apprenticeship office. And I'm so proud to be a part of that team. You know, they work tirelessly going across the country, you know, pre-COVID to conferences, connecting people to opportunities, um, you know, just really explaining the value, the benefit and impact of an apprenticeship program. So I'm excited about these investments. I know there's more to come. Please look at grants.gov. Look at contracts as well to see what we put out. You'll see clear themes that keep uh, that, that are being repeated. Diversification in industry, diversity and inclusion, geographic distribution and diversity as well. Um, you know, you see themes on advancing youth opportunities. You know, what I'm really excited about is that last year too, we launched our Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Grant. $42.5 million. So in the next slide, you'll see that I highlight um, these grantees, where they're located. And this stuff is also on apprenticeship.gov. We also have a Youth as Ready Workforce GPS page that's dedicated to provide technical assistance to these grantees. But I got to tell you, they're youth experts through and through. These are the folks that receive this grant and they're spread across the country to help promote getting young people 16 to 24 in and out of school youth into apprenticeship programs. So we're thrilled about the partnership. They're just, this is hot off the press. They're just out there. They're just getting start, started. If you want to partner with someone, I'm sure they're eager to talk to you about expanding apprenticeship opportunities. Another one that I'm so delighted to talk about as well is our youth apprenticeship intermediaries. I mentioned them brief briefly, but we have Urban Institute, Jobs for the Future, Net America, ICF. This morning, I was just on a health convening with Net America, and they were talking about IT crossing over into healthcare occupations, biotech, AI, you know, um, and it's just so fascinating to even see how the intermediaries work collaboratively together. ICF focuses on cybersecurity. Urban focuses on a plethora of industries, advanced manufacturing, and so on. GFF leverages the partnership to advance youth apprenticeship, the PIA network with New America. So we're really just, you know, strategically using these investments to touch so many different key players across the country to advance the apprenticeship program. So I'm excited to highlight them this morning. Uh, you can find them on our partner finder. I'm sure they'd be happy to have conversations with you as well. So next, I just wanna, again, just reiterate WIOA here. Um, I know I've mentioned it a couple of times. It's really um, pioneered out of the Office of Workforce Investment, Job Corps as well. Um, we have our Youth Build program as well um, that really focuses on leveraging WIO, but we're getting in the game as registered apprenticeship too. And so this deck kind of highlights the key aspects of what is covered in um, under WIOA, the OJT or OJL, the related technical instruction, as well as supportive services. Um, so, you know, if you want a quick desk reference, here it is. Um, so, you know, when you're talking to um, folks at the job centers, the, the local state and local workforce boards, you can use this to say, yes, this is how we can leverage WIOA to support an apprentice uh, while they're entering into their program. So I'm just thrilled and excited uh, to be here to talk to you guys, to answer any questions you may have. Uh, next, please.
And, you know, th this is just a great time and opportunity. I know we're at the end of it, <laughs> the week, the National Apprenticeship Week, but the conversations will continue. We'll still be here as the Office of Apprenticeship to engage with you, to celebrate apprenticeship opportunities, um, to really toot that horn because it is a proven workforce solution. So next you'll see our contact information, apprenticeship at dol.gov. Um, this goes to our highest office, you know, even our administrator, they get to see the questions that flow in. Um, so please contact us. We want to hear from you. We want to engage with you uh, to talk more about apprenticeship opportunities. Lenora, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Next, I would like, I am really pleased to announce and welcome our next presenter. Dan Schofield is the Vice President of the Association for Supply Chain Management Foundation, where he focuses on providing the overall leadership, strategic direction for the foundation's impact investment, philanthropic programs, and leading the foundation's global impact and funding strategies of expanding workforce development opportunities and supply chain, as well as AMC's African Global Health Supply Chain Initiative, funded by in part by Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dan will share with us his foundation's experience in workforce and pre-apprenticeship training. Dan, take it away. Great. Great. Thanks, Lenora. Um, and before I get started, I, I think I just uh, want to talk a little bit about um, some pre-apprenticeship type training, right? So we talk a lot about workforce development, certification, certificates. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit different perspective. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the organization. So ASCM is the Association for Supply Chain Management. Um, it's the largest association for supply chain in the world. They have about 45,000 members individually, about 300 corporate clients. And about two years ago, they decided they were going to start a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. Now, prior to COVID-19, probably nobody ever heard of supply chain, but now uh, you probably can't go 10 minutes without hearing it on TV. So um, we are at a very uh, unfortunate, exciting part uh, uh, in the supply chain industry. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities uh, for pre-apprenticeship programs, apprenticeship programs, and workforce development training. Um, so next slide. So as far as supply chain and workforce development um, within the state of Illinois, um, Governor Pritzker issued an executive order in 2019. And there's a lot on these slides, but uh, you'll be able to see these presentations afterwards. So I won't go through everything. Um, but in order to... Um, uh, to, to align with this executive order and create really good career jobs, we decided through the foundation that we we're going to focus on supply chain pre-apprenticeship and certificate program training. So um, not a lot of people understand prior to the to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was about six open positions for every one qualified supply chain practitioner. Now those open positions pay on average $58,000 a year and they don't require college degrees. So that was a really big misnomer for us. Um, ASCM and the association for 60 years have been, has been doing supply chain training efforts and workforce development on the corporate level. So through the foundation, we focus on underserved areas, areas in need. Um, and then with the pandemic in this post-pandemic society that hopefully we will all get to eventually, uh, displaced workers. So the retail industry, the restaurant industry, small business, we have about 20 million unemployed people in the United States right now, but the state of Illinois actually hired 40,000 supply chain practitioners last month. So as you can see, while other industries are suffering supply chain and how everyone gets their groceries delivered within an hour and gets their Amazon packages every day, um, supply chain is really a, a growing um, area of work right now. Um, also, it's important to talk about that we follow uh, TPM, which is Talent Pipeline Management Methodology. Um, so again, we focus on enabling skills-based training. So we have our programs really starting with um, initial cohorts, pilots. Uh, we do um, market surveys specific to areas, counties, regions, et cetera. Um, so we can understand the actual skills needed. So much like an apprenticeship where you would learn skills on the job, we learn what skills are required from these employers ahead of time. And then we train on specific skill sets within supply chain. 
Now, why do we do that? Because there's no job called supply chain, just like engineering. There's no job called engineering. You're an electrical engineer or an industrial engineer, a mechanical engineer. Supply chain isn't different. There's demand planners, inventory planners, there's um, facility builders, architects, et cetera. Um, so we want to know when we go into a specific community, what are the actual skills that are going to lead to these apprenticeships, these internships? Um, but most importantly, what can we train at a tactical level as a pre-apprenticeship program um, in order to have these uh, candidates with fulfilling jobs before they even are done with the program? Next slide. So these uh, diagrams right here look really confusing. It kind of, if you have kids, it kind of looks like they're just scribbling all over a, a page at Denny's when you're waiting for your food or something like that. But um, A, the top one, is actually a um, graphical representation of all of the railway logistic routes in the United States right now. And B is all of the trucking routes. So one thing you'll notice that these have in common is Illinois, right in the center of both. So about 60% of all goods that transit the United States actually go through the state of Illinois. Um, specifically, uh, Cook County, Chicago has roughly 65% of all supply chain routes. So um, a little funny story I like to tell is my first job out of, out of college uh, as a supply chain engineer, I worked for FedEx Corporation. And uh, the first iPod was getting ready to come into the United States. And if if you can remember what that first iPod was, it was a big clunky one that held, I think, like 25 songs. So you can see where technology has gone. Um, but that first iPod, we were moving about 3 million of them a week into the United States, and they were all coming through Cook County. Why? Because if we have a plane that lands from China into Cook County, we can by truck and rail reach eastern and western part of the United States overnight. So um, that's how important supply chain is within the state of Illinois specifically and why we really focus on these workforce development programs here. Next slide. So without getting into every one of these, um, these are when I talked about we, how we do market based studies ahead of time. So we understand what topics and what skills are required from the employers. This is just a uh, example. A lot of times people say things like inventory management. What does inventory management mean in supply chain? It can mean one of these 20 different things. So this is why it's so important for us to do pre-apprenticeship surveys, because it's unlike other industries where if you are um, going into a chef apprenticeship, okay, there is a ton of different types of cuisine, ton of different skills that you need to learn. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, the skills are um, transferable among types of food that you would cook. Uh, with supply chain, that's not the case. Uh, it is a very broad area of, of workforce development. Um, but with the opportunities that exist today, uh, these are the skills that we're trying to teach uh, people so they can get back into the workforce or if they're incumbent workers, be skilled up to uh, management levels. Next slide. And again, Distribution and logistics, another thing. People talk about inventory, people talk about logistics. Uh, logistics isn't just trucks. Um, so logistics could be anything from building the actual facility to uh, how do you distribute goods across modes of transportation um, and to get into um, uh, something a little bit more technical, but what everyone will understand is called reverse logistics. So when you get your package from Amazon, if it's something that doesn't fit, it's got to go back somewhere. So you actually have to do the same logistics process, but backwards. So all of these are extremely specialized, but we, uh, we're lucky enough to have, uh, like I said, 45,000 individual members. Um, and next slide. And one of the things that we've, uh, next slide as well, sorry. Um, and one of the things that we like to offer with our uh, pre-apprenticeship programs is membership to the ASCM network. Uh, next slide. So why is that important? Uh, typically, when you go out and you get an apprenticeship job or pre-apprenticeship opportunity, um, you, you learn on the job, you learn from coworkers, you have kind of that network. Well, as far as supply chain, because there are so many supply chain global um, professionals, we actually provide people uh, 
opportunities to work with ASCM certified supply chain professionals. They get access to career coaches and job boards and, um, you know, student loan refinancing if they've gone through college, um, scholarship opportunities. We have a case competition for um, college students and two-year university students that has about 550 schools a year, and they actually solve a supply chain problem that is written by a professional consulting firm. So it's a great way to think about um, apprenticeship programs from a pre-apprenticeship workforce development side and something very specific, but something that touches almost every aspect of society today. Uh, with that being said, I'll, I'll pass that over to Lenora and thank you again for, for everyone's time. Lenora, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Dan. It's depreciated. <laughs> Sorry about that. Dan, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. This concludes our webinar part of the, of the webinar, and we'll start a Q&A period. You may be able to ask questions uh, to our panelists, um, and we will really advise everybody to use the chat function in Zoom. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link after the presentation. So I am gonna be following the chat and let's see what we have here today for our speakers. We have, um, we have a question from Nancy. Uh, is it possible to receive the slides for today? Yes, Nancy, there is a possibility to receive the slides today. Um, let's see, um, I have a question, is there, um, no current apprenticeship programs that fit our company's needs. What is the process for us to establish a new program? This is from uh, Kevin. And uh, any of the panelists can answer this question. So going back, if there's no current apprenticeship programs that fit the company needs, what is the process for us to establish a new program for our apprenticeship? Well, I think we can find an apprenticeship program that will fit your needs. Uh, there's the registered apprenticeship program, and then there's also the industry recognized apprenticeship program. So the goal is to train for a specific job. So um, I think if we outline what the job is that you're training for, uh, Kevin, then we can outline a program that uh, would meet your needs. I think it's I don't know what Kevin, what industry or what uh, jobs that we're looking to fill or to uh, to train in, but I certainly think it's definitely worth the conversation. I think it can happen. Because they're, they're very flexible. I mean, you know, a registered apprenticeship program, a minimum requirement is 144 hours of classroom time, and then, you know, so many hours of on the job training. And so we would just have to identify what those skills are, and education components that are needed to um, fill the, the job. And then we can map that out and, uh, and then submit that to the Department of Labor. Lenore, you're on mute still. I also, so it, will they have access to our contact information, Lenora, if um, you know they want to follow up separately? Mm -hmm. No problem. We have that as well. Um, we also have a question. What's the difference between an intermediary and a navigator? And Craig, I'm going to go ahead and let you answer your first question. I know from, uh, from my perspective, I'm a navigator. I am sort of your resource, your liaison, concierge to uh, available to help your company navigate the whole apprenticeship process from understanding the application process as well as helping you create a curriculum if that's uh, possible, and then leading you to an intermediary, which is Craig's organization. Uh, just the information for the team out there, we have nine uh, intermediaries for the various sec sectors uh, here in area EDR4. Uh, that is accessible for different uh, sectors in healthcare, IT, transportation, logistics, and manufacturing, and small business. Correct. And, um, you know, as Lenore said, a navigator is one who just kind of makes the connection and hands it off to an intermediary, such as uh, the Calumet Area Industrial Commission, where we'll, we can walk you through the process 
um, as I explained, you know, um, outlining the job, what are the, uh, what's the educational requirements, what are the on the job requirements, and helping put all that together and submitting that to the Department of Labor. Um, you know, helping you identify mentors, helping, you know, whatever it is to really get you up and running to get an apprenticeship program up and running at your company. So that's what, you know, we do as an intermediary is we, we make those connections um, and help you map it out and uh, provide the, you know, kind of the consultative services that, uh, you know, are, are needed to get you going. Um, and then I think navigators and intermediaries are also outlined on, is it um, IllinoisApprenticeships.com? Uh, .gov. Gov. Gov. And uh, it does map out what those are and, and who they and who they are. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So um, just to let everybody know, I'm just I'm looking at another computer here uh, with the various chats. There's a question from Stacy Delaney. Is there a difference between apprenticeship and uh, apprenticeship and internship? Uh, Michelle, or uh, Dina, yeah, Michelle? <laughs> yes, definitely. There is a difference. Um, so quickly, uh, let me try in a very kind of linear way. So internships can be paid or unpaid. Apprenticeships are paid. Internships, you don't have to have a mentor, that one-to-one -one no. ratio. Registered apprenticeship, you have to. Internships, um, you know, on OGL, could be somewhat flexible in, in terms of what they mean by that. On the job learning is very prescriptive per 29, 29.5 as it relates to real on the job learning, hands-on instruction and training, meaning you're doing something that is within that occupation or field. You're not just bringing coffee. Um, in terms of <laughs> In terms of uh, the wage aspect, too, I touch on that, that a little bit, but in apprenticeship, there's what we call progressive wage increases. So as your skill increases, so does um, the payment for your skills. So rewards for skills gained, right? That's a big difference. So you, as your proficiency increase, your pay increases to align with what folks in the industry are getting paid. Difference between internship and apprenticeship Apprenticeship, you get an industry recognized credential. And these aren't just things that we, you know, the department stamps its approval and say, here's a credential. It has been vetted by key folks within the industry that say, here's the proficiency. We're going to recognize this credential across the Google, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the whoever, for example, in IT. Um, and so that is portable across multiple states. Right, an internship at XYZ place can carry a different meeting if you cross across state lines. Um, so the value of that credential, I mean, I can't talk enough about it. Um, it's just so critical, right? Especially when people talk about interim credentials now, stacking on credentials, the future of work and what that means. So that's the key component of an apprenticeship that you don't always get in an internship opportunity. Um, and just want to kind of highlight to that um, on apprenticeship.gov, we have resources like that too, um, you know, in our fact sheets that kind of break down and explain the difference. Uh, you know, another question we always get is, is you know, how is it different from co-ops as well? You know, it's another one that comes up quite frequently. Again, um, registered apprenticeship has a prescribed amount of RTI, 144 hours recommended, and then 2,000 hours required of on-the-job learning. And typically, an apprenticeship um, lasts for a minimum of one year, right? It could be longer depending on what's required in that specific occupation and field. Um, so again, just want to kind of highlight those differences, um, you know, in terms of the between internships and apprenticeships. Hope that helps. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this concludes our webinar. My contact information is on the screen for everyone who needs further information or assistance setting up or supporting an apprenticeship program or pre-apprenticeship program. I'm also available to meet, whether in person or virtually, to discuss apprenticeship opportunities and needs for companies. Please note that we will hold monthly apprenticeship webinars throughout the year and next year. Again, I would like to thank all of our wonderful speakers this morning, our panelists, and I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Have a wonderful day.
Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Friday.